Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. Today we'll be looking at one possible way to produce radionuclides, and that's nuclear reactors. In particular, we'll look at the means of how these radioisotopes are produced in reactors. And there's two main processes. The first is fission processes, where elements are broken apart and the corresponding parts are themselves radionuclides. The other process is neutron activation, where you bombard elements with neutrons and you add an extra neutron to the nucleus of the atom and then it becomes an unstable radionuclide that's about to decay. I hope you enjoyed this video and let's get to it. Okay, hello everyone. We are gonna start our lecture number four of this course today. We're gonna talk about production of radionuclides. So what we see in nature is that most naturally occurring radioisotopes are very long lived. So for example, we have Potassium-40 has a half-life of 10 to the 9 years, and they're typically very heavy elements like uh, uranium and radium. So then the question that I have for you guys to think is, how important are these heavy elements in metabolic or physiologic processes in the body? Uh, are they really important or not so much? So I'll give you 10 seconds, think about it a little bit. Okay, and then the answer is okay. These elements for what our body needs are not really very important. So back in the days, like around in the 1920s, 1930s, in the early stages of nuclear medicine, they started trying to use some of these natural radionuclides. But again, because of what I just said, because of what I just got you to think about, um, there was not much use in nuclear medicine for these radioisotopes. And if you think about, as we said, nuclear medicine counsel is functional. It's a, well, it gives us functional imaging. It gives us information about how the body is working. So what we wanna track, what we're gonna be able to see, what we're gonna be able to image is a radioisotope or a radiopharmaceutical that has some function in our metabolism or in our physiology. So of course these naturally existing elements are not that important. That's why people didn't really find much, much use for them in nuclear medicine. So if we wanna use radioisotopes, radionuclides in nuclear medicine, then we have to manufacture them ourselves. So yeah, that's how it's typically done. So how is this done? How do we manufacture radioisotopes? Well, we do this by bombarding stable nuclei with other particles. So for example, we can use protons or neutrons that when they interact with the nucleus of that other nuclei, stable nuclei, they can result in unstable nuclei and we have a radioisotope. So, so let's dig into this radioisotope production. So there are several factors to consider when we are producing radioisotopes. So one is a clinical application. As discussed in the past, we want to use a radioisotope to get images, or do we want to use a radioisotope to treat tumors? That's just an example. We want, well, well we, we have to look at the chemical properties of that radioisotope. So I don't know if you guys remember from lecture one, let's say we develop molecules to target particular uh, processes in the body to be able to either image them or to be able to treat we need to combine those molecules with a radioisotope but now we can have many nice molecules that act very good that they would go to the target that we want but but if we cannot really attach the the radioisotope then we're not gonna get too far so so we need to know what are the chemical properties of that particular radioisotope so that we can that we know how can they be combined with other molecules or what can they not be linked to the production method we're going to talk about that in a moment that decay mode energies again we need to understand um, if if it's beta if it's gamma decay and what are the energies of those emissions uh, for the particular pr purposes of either imaging or treating we need to understand what is the half-life of that radioisotope. 
So we don't want to have a radioisotope that is very, very short lived that we cannot even have, that we don't even have time to bring it into the patient. But again, this is radiation. We don't want this radioisotope to stay inside the patient being radioactive and have a radioactive patient for the rest of his life. So, so we need to have some consideration of when, what is the physical half of this radioisotope. And again, that's related to the dose to the patient. Then the specific activity that we are able to get, the specific activity means how much radioactivity do we get per unit mass of that radioisotope. So you might end up getting some isotopes that are not radioactive, but they're still adding to the mass. So of course, the more activity we get in that unit of mass, the better. And again, it's related to this radionuclide purity when we produce radiopharmaceutical, when we produce radio, radionuclides, you might end up getting more than just the radioisotope that you're interested in. And again, of course, cost is an important factor. We, we need to ideally find a way of creating these radioisotopes in the cheapest way as possible if they are gonna make it to the clinic. So again, so how to make radioisotopes? And as I said at the beginning, we're gonna bombard the nucleus of a stable isotope with other particles such as neutrons, protons, alpha particles, and maybe some others. And there are two main ways of producing them. Uh, one is in a nuclear reactor, another one is using a particle accelerator. So when we talk about nuclear reactors, we just need to keep in mind that nuclear reactors, their main purpose is not to produce radio, radioisotopes for, for clinical use. The main purpose of a nuclear reactor is to generate electricity. So isotope production is just a secondary application. And nuclear reactors, typically we use them when we want to obtain more or less longer lived isotopes. Now, particle accelerators, they have an advantage that they can be like small cyclotrons that can be installed in the hospital. And, and they might be very useful for locally needed isotopes. Uh, we use them to produce many isotopes, but we're mostly interested in like short lived isotopes. So let's talk about the first method of producing the radioisotopes, which is about the nuclear reactor. So this is how more or less a power plant would look like. So there's a reactor and, well, and we're gonna talk about in detail about this in a moment, but, but the, the idea is that there's some radioactivity and that radioactivity, because of what we saw, we, we, is gonna be releasing some energy and we're gonna use that energy to boil water basically, and then we're gonna have some steam and that steam is gonna move some turbines that move a generator and that's what produces electricity. And then we're trying to cool down that steam to reuse the water. But, but, but let's look at this part, like the reactor itself, which is what we're interested in. So when we look at the reactor, which is we call the core of the reactor, what we have in there is a fission level material. So for example, uranium-235. And as we discussed in the previous lecture, you know, when you fission one of those heavy, heavy elements, um, they release some energy. So what's interesting about uranium-235 is that it goes through spontaneous fission. Well, it has a very long half-life, but this fission splits in lighter nuclei and it releases, well, it depends on the path that it follows, it can release two or three fission neutrons. So it splits apart and then we have some neutrons uh, moving around that medium. Now that spontaneous fission, as I just said, it releases two or three neutrons that doesn't contribute to many neutrons or contribute to too much energy. What's really, really important about this is that those neutrons can cause additional fission. So let's say you have some uranium-235, you get one of those neutrons coming from a spontaneous fission. That neutron comes into the nucleus of uranium-235. Now you have uranium-236. And uranium-236 is a very, very unstable nuclei that is gonna split apart and it's gonna release more energy. And then in that splitting apart, we're gonna obtain more neutrons that are gonna, in principle, start some of these other fissions. Um, 
Yeah, so the goal in a nuclear reactor is to have each of those neutrons coming out from a fission process, we want it to start one extra fission. So when on, when on average, each neutron from one fission starts another fission, we, we say, okay, that's a controlled nuclear chain reaction. Because if you have now on average, one of those neutrons starting more than one fission, then the reaction is gonna keep growing and growing. So this uranium, this radio, radioactive element is located in what we call the fuel cells, which let me see what I hear. Uh, well, it's basically these cells that, I, that the diagram is showing in orange. Around here. Um, so what we do then is we have the fuel cells and we put what we call the moderator material around those fuel cells. So that moderator material can be, for example, heavy water or graphite. So what is the purpose of the, of the moderator? Okay. So the moderator, the idea is that it's going to use slow down those neutrons coming out from the from those fission processes. And why do we want to slow down those neutrons? Well, because when you have slower neutrons in, that we call thermal neutrons, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, these slower neutrons have a higher chance of, of interacting or being trapped with nuclei in the vicinity. So we, again, remember, we're trying to bombard a stable nuclei with, in this case, neutrons. We want to put this neutron inside that nuclei, and then that will make this heavier nucleus unstable, and then we're going to have some radiation. Um, yeah, so that probability of getting that nucleus inside that other, sorry, of getting that neutron inside that other nucleus is increased when we have neutrons that are slow neutrons that have around more or less this energy. And why do we call these thermal neutrons? Um, because, well, if you maybe recall from thermodynamics uh, that you can find the energy of, of particles, let's say in a gas that is related to the Boltzmann constant and the temperature. So if you multiply that Boltzmann constant by, I don't know, let's say the, average room temperature, you get energies of around these well, energies around these values. So that's what we call them thermal neutrons. Yeah, and this is why I was saying thermal neutrons are easily captured by the stable nuclei in their surrounding. So they can more easily start new fissions. Now then we have these other things that is called the control rods, which are the black rods that I'm showing here. So control rods, they are typically made of boron or cadmium, and their purpose is to absorb neutrons. But the advantage of these control rods is that they absorb neutrons, but they don't then under, undergo more fissions. So we position those control rods in and out to control the reaction. So if you put the control rods in, you're gonna basically remove a lot of those neutrons that would cause fission. So, so yeah, so it would stop the reaction. If you remove the control rods, there's nothing like getting, removing those neutrons from the reaction. So you will, you will have more, more fissions going. And, and these control routes, again, ideally, is uh, we use them to have one additional fission per fission event. So one fission will stimulate another fission. That's, that's the goal. And, and then we can talk then about this thing they call the reproduction constant K of a reactor, which will be the average, which is defined as the average number of neutrons from each fission that cause a subsequent fission. So the maximum value is around 2.5. Like you can think that one neutron on average can cause a maximum of another two and a half fissions, but it's, it's normally less than this because well, one, some of the neutrons escape the region that contains a fission level nuclei. 
And two, some of those neutrons may also be captured by other nuclei in the reactor that are not necessarily fission. And well, the control rods will be but one example, but maybe there's also water circulating around that you might end up capturing. And there's other elements in the reactor that might also trap some of those. So, so let's think. So if that reproduction, reproduction constant K of our reactor, if it's equal to one, then we say, okay, this reaction is self-sustainable. That's what we want. If the reproduction constant is less than one, then as time goes by, the reaction will slowly die out because yeah, at some point there's going to be no new fissions caused by these new, new neutrons. And if K is significantly greater than one, then it says that the reaction is kind of run away and well, it basically goes out of control and can lead to the meltdown of, of that reactor core. So there's going to be just too much energy release and it's going to start melting everything around it. I'm coming, I'm defining here something that we call the reaction rate, which is the number of nuclei that fission per unit time. So how many nuclei that you have are undergoing fission per, per interval of time? So I have, I have a question and I know it's, it might not be very easy. We'll talk about it, but I want you guys to think to see if we can more or less get into how a nuclear reactor it is doing. So let's think. So the thing that the average time between fission generations, and by this I mean what is the time that it takes for an in, between an emit when a when a neutron is emitted to start another fission? So let's think that that time is one millisecond. Let's say that the average number of neutrons from each fission that start another fission is 1.001. So on average, one neutron will, st will stimulate 1.001 other fissions. So if you start with an initial reaction rate, how long based on these numbers do you think is gonna take to double the reaction rate? Think on it for a moment. We're gonna look at it in detail after it. Try to try to try to answer. Let's let's spend some couple of minutes. So the poll is open, so please uh, think about it and enter your answers. Yeah, and don't get discouraged. I know that this, as a first time, might not be very easy. We'll go through it. And it's just because I want to show you something based on this question in a couple of slides. Again, to remind everyone, these are anonymous polls. We don't know who is voting for what, and so feel free to share. Uh, it also helps us understand what your thinking is. Even if you're not 100% sure, feel free to pick something. I'm just going to wait for some, a little bit more answers. Because I know this is, I mean, this is probably the first time many people are seeing a, on a question like this, so it's okay. Yeah, we have about two thirds of the people having answered, so, so that's okay. good. People are answering. Wait 30 more seconds just yes, to see, and I'll stop it.
Okay, let's look. So, okay, most people went with A, but you see that our results are mixed. So let's look at it in detail. Um, okay. So we can start by finding the number of generations needed to double the number of fissions. So, so what you can think, okay, let's, let's assume for a moment that, that each fission would start two fissions. Let's say one fission will then create another two fissions. Then the next generation, each of those two fissions will create another two fissions. So this is gonna start growing exponentially. It will be two to the zero, we have one fission first. Then in the next generation, which will be two to the one, we have two fissions. Then in the next generation, we have each of those two starting two. So we have two to the two equals four and so on and so on. So that's why it's an exponential growth. So we wanna know, okay, if we wanna double the number of fissions, we have to go 1.001 to the n equals two. So n will be how many generations do I need to have twice the number of fissions? Then, well, you can quickly solve for n. So n take the logarithm on both sides, and it gives you n equals 693. So after 693 generations, so we have doubled the number of fissions happening in the reactor. Now, if we know that each generation takes one millisecond, then we have 693 generations times one millisecond then that means that we would be doubling the, the, the yeah, we'll be doubling the re reaction rate in 0.693 seconds. Okay, so then the correct answer was A because of what I just showed you, but then think about it. This is less than one second. That's definitely not enough time to insert control rods. So control rods have a mechanical or mechanism, sorry for, for it sounds weird, but there's a mechanism that lowers the rod. So yeah, it, 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 it definitely won't lower these rods in just less than one second. So why? I mean, but, but, but we know that in, in, in these reactors, well, we're definitely not seeing too many things bad going on. Um, so, so what is really happening back there? Because, okay, so let's now assume that 0.65% of those nu neutrons being emitted are delayed by 14 seconds. So again, think about it. And then what will be the average generation time? And then what will be the doubling time if we take the same conditions from, from, the, from the previous question? So again, think about that most of the emissions are gonna happen, most of the generations are gonna come within one millisecond. A very small percentage of those are delayed to 14 seconds. But again, we're still gonna go to the 693 generations because that's what we saw that it's, it's required to double the rate. And, and this is the same thing. So try to think again, a little bit about this one. So first, what is the average generation time? That would be the answer on the left. And then what will be the doubling time? So that's 0.65%, not 65%, right? Yes, 0.65%, less than 1%. I hope everyone sees that there is a poll so you can vote in there. Take your time, maybe try to do the math. I haven't seen this question, so I'm doing it myself too.
Okay, let's wait 30 more seconds and we can look into it. Okay, let's Let's go at it again. So most people are saying D, but you see our answers are mixed. So let's let's take a look at, at what is that is happening in there. Okay, so to calculate the average generation time, what we're supposed to do is basically just take like a uh, a weighted average of the time. So we know that 0.65% of neutrons are delayed by 14 seconds. So I'm gonna weight that by that percentage. And then the other 99.35% of neutrons, we know that it takes one millisecond. So if we average those times and we get an average generation time of 0 0.092 seconds. So we went from one millisecond to like 92 milliseconds just because of having less than 1% of those neutrons delayed by 14 seconds. So if this is our average generation time now, remember we needed 693 generations before to, to double that rate. Now that's gonna happen in 63.8 seconds. Oh, sorry, I forgot the unit here. That's basically 64 seconds. So now this gives us plenty of time to insert the control rods. And the reason I'm showing you these two questions is because something like this is exactly what happens in those nuclear reactors. So a lot of these, well, not even a lot, but some of these neutrons are what we call delayed neutrons. So what that means is that, yes, we end up obtaining neutrons from these fission processes, but, but a lot of them don't necessarily just come directly as soon as the fission happens. So many come from, you have a fission process, and then in the daughters of that fission, later radioactive decay will release some of those neutrons. So that's what we call them delayed neutrons. And they're gonna typically be delayed by around 14 seconds. So they will come 14 seconds after that initial fission happened. And just by that, we have a lot of more time to move in and out those control rods to, to make sure that we have well, that the, the reaction is not going out of control. So, well, of course, things has gone, have gone bad. You, you probably heard about what happened in Chernobyl in the 80s. Um, and there's a series for that that you might want to watch. It, I found it interesting. But the thing that each nuclear fission releases around 200 to 300 MeV of energy. Again, keep in mind this energy is most released as thermal energy that we use to boil water, to then use the steam to move a turbine, turbine generating electricity. So the main purpose, and keep that in mind of those reactors, is to generate electricity. Uh, for us in nuclear medicine, it's a secondary purpose that we can get some, some radioisotopes from them. But then, okay, but that's what we're talking about. We saw a nuclear reactor, Hope it's more or less clear how a nuclear reactor works, but how is that we use nuclear reactors for us in nuclear medicine? So there's two ways that we can obtain radioisotopes from those nuclear reactors. Okay, the first one you would think is we have fission processes. These fission processes split the nucleus and we're gonna end up with some radioactive nuclei radioisotope after that fission. We can then probably just go and take those daughters from the fission rate from the fission process and and use them for for medicine or there's also something called neutron activation which again remember this nuclear reactor we're gonna have we're having a, a big flux of neutrons we have neutrons moving all around so what we can think is 
we can put a target of, of a particular element inside the reactor. And well, um, we, we know that if we put this particular element there and then this element is bombarded with those neutrons that are in the reactor, we're going to end up obtaining another element, another nucleus, one of the radioisotopes that we are interested in. And then we can take that target after some time and separate the radioisotope that, that we want. So well, that first method is what we call fission fragments. So basically, we take those fragments and use them. And the second one is what is called neutron activation, because it's those neutrons that activate that stable nuclear to become radioactive and then generate the radioisotope that we want. Um, yeah, but the problem with fission fragments, for example, is that there can be many different products. So an example is if you have uranium-235 and a neutron comes into this nucleus, you have now uranium-236. I've been saying that uranium-236 is very, very unstable. So it's just going to fission and it can generate barium-144, krypton-89, and release three neutrons. So well, let's say if in medicine we would be into, if we if we were interested in let's say in krypton eighty nine or in barium one forty four for for some reason, then we would think okay well I know that this reaction occurring in the nuclear reactor, these nuclei are hanging around there those are fission fragments from uranium two thirty six I'm just gonna go and collect them and then I'll bring them to the clinic to do what it's needed, but the problem is uranium two thirty six can also go to krypton 92 and barium 141, or it can even go to rubidium 96 and cesium 137. So, so there can be many, many different products from these fission fragments. And, and what I'm showing here on the right is if you think about the fission fragments of uranium 235, this is the probability of the masses for those fragments. And you can think that the probability of getting this uranium-235, well, when you get the neutron, it will be uranium-236 split in two equal parts, which is A equals 118, is low compared to two other probabilities. So typically, they don't split in two equal parts. It's typically, one is heavier than the other, as, as you guys are seeing in those examples on the left. Um, so yeah, so, so sometimes it's not that easy to just go and find the fission fragments, but it's an option. But the fission products, well, those fission products typically have an excess of neutrons and then further undergo beta minus decay. So think about it. So when do you think a, a nucleus would undergo beta plus decay versus beta minus decay? Remember, this is gonna bring those nucleus to the line of stability that we've discussed before. So in beta minus, so what happens in beta minus? We have, so in beta minus, we have a neutron that becomes a proton and then it releases some particles. Again, so is this neutron becoming a proton? So you're saying, okay, if you have a nucleus that has an excess of of, of neutrons, they would most certainly undergo beta minus decay. It's the opposite for, for beta plus for positron decay. Now it's a proton that becomes a neutron. So if you have an excess of protons, they will typically go through positron decay. But then here in fission, our fission products typically have an excess of neutrons, so they typically go through beta decay. And there's another way, well, we can use some of the intermediates of that decay that might end up having a reasonable long life, long half-life, then maybe we can just go and extract some new ones. So, so for example, one of the fission products that we can get in a nuclear reactor is yttrium-99. Yttrium-99 follows beta minus decay with a half-life of 1.5 seconds to let's say zirconium-99. And zirconium-99 can go just beta decay in 21 seconds to rubidium 99, that then goes beta decay to molybdenum 99, and molybdenum 99 has a 66 hour half life, and we know that molybdenum 99 then decays to technetium 99M, 
and this is something that we've discussed in the past. Well, we know that most of our nuclear medicine procedures use technician 99M. And we're seeing that technician 99M comes from molybdenum 99. So, so this is one of those intermediates that interest us. So we'll try to go and extract molybdenum 99 from the nuclear reactor because we know that later on it will decay to technician 99. That is something that we know has a, a lot of applications in the clinic. So this is just an example of how we can use those fission fragments or the intermediates in the decays that follow them for something useful in nuclear medicine. Carlos, we have a question. Um... And I think it's a good question. It's about um, available. I guess the question is about you know pricing. You know, given the fact that there's significant efforts going on, um, you know, what is the typical price of these isotopes per gram? And you know, I I guess there's in the chapter also, and perhaps later you will talk about availability issues and things like that. But do you have a general comment to make about pricing? Mm -hmm. raise the isotopes, for example, as we deal with ourselves in our center and things like that? Yeah, no, I, I don't know. I don't want to give a number of pricing right now, but right. I'll definitely take a look. I'll, I'll let you guys know next week just to see how much do we pay or we get technician, for example, or where we right. get a generator. We'll talk about them. Um, so it really, it really varies, uh, if I may comment, it really varies from isotope to isotope, radioisotope to radioisotope. And it also depends on the world shortage. And for example, in the case of molybdenum, there has been significant challenges in the past decade with shortages of it. And perhaps Carlos might refer to it in the text also, we talk about alternative ways of uh, producing it because technetium, which is a, which is shown here in the figure at the, at the bottom, at the very right, is, 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 is the bread and butter of uh, you know, uh, uh, nuclear medicine imaging in, in non-PET applications. Uh, and there's been shortages, so there's alternative ways of doing it. And those shortages obviously impact some of those things, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I'll let you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look into how much we're paying for those stuff, and maybe I'll just put an answer on, on Teams, but I'll, I'll definitely get back to you. What was the person that asked? Okay, sorry, I don't have access to the chat right now, but I'll get back to you. Yeah, so, so I was saying, okay, so fission fragments, then just to summarize a little bit, they have an excess of neutrons. Now these fission products may be carrier free and that can lead to high specific activity. And, and well, there is a lack of specificity in the fission pro process because low, you all the, all of the isotopes, I mean, basically, because we can have so many different daughters coming out of those fission processes it's hard to just say, okay, for sure, I'm gonna get the isotope that I want because it might be a mixture of many of them. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about neutron activation, which was the other effect that I was saying. So, so those neutrons can, can be used to initiate more reactions when hitting a target. And well, when that neutron bombards that nucleus, then that target can become radioactive. And then we have, several ways of representing those reactions. So for example, we have the neutron capture, which we call neutron. Okay, basically you have a nucleus, then you bombard it with a neutron, and then the result is an excited state of the same element. Look, we, we're not changing the proton number, but of course now you have an extra neutron in the nucleus. So you have an excited state, and then because it's an excited state of the nuclei, it will go down eventually to go to a lower energy state, it will release gammas. And well, you can either represent it like this, or you can just say, okay, I have my initial nucleus, I'm bombarding with a neutron, I'm coming to an excited state because it releases a gamma. There's also something called nucleon exchange. So if you bombard this nucleus with a neutron, you're basically exchanging the, the neutron for a, the, a one proton for a neutron. So basically neutron comes in, but a proton is kicked out. So now you lose, you lose a proton. That's why the element changes, but the mass stays the same. And, and then that you can also represent it like this. So you read this by I'm bombarding my nuclei, my nucleus on the left with a neutron. This is what I obtain after that, and then a proton comes out of that. 
or maybe you can also start another fission but maybe a neutron comes in and then it undergoes fission which is basically what we've been discussing all the way so far now products of these neutron activation are typically radioactive and on how much of that new radio nuclide do you obtain depends on well, the intensity of the neutron flux, the neutron energies, and many and um, some other variables. I'm gonna get to that a little bit better later in this lecture. So give let's leave it there for a moment. So so just think that in this neutron activation, well, neutrons have been added. So then the products will tend to decay again, be a beta minus decay again. There's gonna be an excess of neutrons. N gamma is the most common production reaction, but then this is not carrier free because the product is the same element as the target material. So remember carrier free is when you only have a radioisotope of that element in that sample, but here you haven't changed the element. So some of those nuclei are gonna be radioactive, some of them won't. So, so it's, it's not gonna be carrier free. Well, it can produce a carrier-free product if it activates a short-lived intermediate, like well, now it becomes another element. And well, so that's why neutron proton can produce carrier-free because here we change the element. And something to keep in mind is that even at high neutron fluxes, only a small fraction of target nuclei are activated. So, so typically from, let's say from every, 10 million neutrons, you will activate one of those targets or something in the order of one to 10 to the six or one to 10 to the nine, basically. Between, you would activate one nucleus for every 10 to the six or 10 to the, something between 10 to the six and 10 to the nine neutrons that are hitting that target.